Hello and welcome to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. The devastating explosion in Lebanon last week is just one of many crises causing profound suffering for the people there. Already, the economic and political crises in the nation have brought the country to the brink of collapse. What is behind these crises and what can be done? Doug Becker explores. I'm Doug Becker. Lebanon has experienced warfare, economic hardship, and terrorism throughout its recent history. From the war that raged in the nation from 1975 until 1990, where an estimated 120,000 people were killed, through foreign occupation, instability, the nation has had a difficult history. This week, on August 4th, an explosion devastated Beirut, killing at least 100 people and wounding thousands. But this explosion shocked the nation in the midst of a horrible economic crisis and a tremendous lack of faith in the competence of the current government. Protesters have taken to the streets since October of 2019, demanding economic reforms and many demanding a new government. Conditions worsened to the point of hyperinflation in June of 2020, and the government withered as it contemplated the pain of an international monetary fund bailout of its currency. Tamara al Rafai, spokesperson for the UN Relief and Works Agency, which manages the Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon, has declared that, quote, it's an economic crisis, a financial crisis, a political crisis, a health crisis, and now this horrible explosion. On today's show, we explore how Lebanon got to this point and what it will take for this nation to rebuild. Our guests are Dr. Hannes Baumann, who is senior lecturer in the politics department of the University of Liverpool and visiting fellow of the London School of Economics, Middle East Center. He is the author of Citizen Harari, Lebanon's Neoliberal Reconstruction and the Causes, Nature and Effect of the Current Crisis in Lebanese Capitalism. And Dr. Basil Salouk, who is associate professor of political science in the Department of Social Sciences at the Lebanese American University. He is the author of Taif and the Lebanese State, The Political Economy of a Very Sectarian Public Sector, and co-author of The Politics of Sectarianism in Postwar Lebanon. Dr. Salouk, first, you're in Lebanon. Can you describe for us what the conditions currently are in that state? Much of the population is really in a state of numbness and dazed after the catastrophic explosion that occurred on the 4th of August. Before the 4th of August, we were all talking about the death of the Lebanon that we've known so far, particularly the post-war Lebanon, uh, given the overlapping fiscal, economic, financial, uh, banking uh, crisis that we ha- we're experiencing. But but this is really something at a, at a very different scale. I mean, I've lived in Lebanon through the Civil War. I've lived through the 2006 war. But this is, this is really different. I mean, the extent of the devastation has, uh, has really shocked everyone. As is always the case, Lebanese know that they don't have a state to rely on. And so they take the initiative and they start cleaning their streets and clearing the rubble and so on. But having said that, I think we are really at a, at a crossroad now. Either what has happened will create the kind of momentum for accountability, for transformation in the political system and the, in the way politics and everything else was being done in Lebanon since the post-war years. Or this will prove to be the knockout blow. Any hope for Uh, salvaging the situation from the existing economic financial crisis will be gone. And the the Lebanon we've we've known in all its complications and complexities will be gone forever. Dr. Bauman, this crisis and of course the explosion as Mark the News takes place in the context of a terrible and worsening economic crisis. What's the nature of this crisis and how do things get so bad? 
I think the main aspect of it at the moment for the Lebanese is uh, the um, fall of the currency, so the, the collapse of the currency, whereby since 1997 and until uh, about September last year, the exchange rate of the Lebanese lira was stable against the dollar. So you could use dollar and a certain amount of Lebanese lira almost interchangeably. People were using both at the same time. They could also have accounts, for instance, uh, deposit accounts, in either of them. That was for a long time unsustainable. Lebanon is one of the most highly indebted countries in the world. Um, it's extremely import uh, dependent. So that's, that's quite important for the story. It imports also a lot of its uh, foodstuffs and doesn't export as much. So it has a high a current account deficit, as they call it. And that's unsustainable over the long term. And so the limit of that system was reached. So the, the currency collapsed. And of course, that means for consumers that everything that they buy in the shops becomes extremely much more expensive. So I believe last month, and Basel will know the figures better, but I believe the annual inflation rate was 90%. So you can imagine what that means for families who were anyways living on sort of the precipice of, of, of poverty. And a lot of families are being are now falling into poverty. And add to that, and we'll come to, I'm sure, we'll talk about the nature of the Lebanese state and all its failings, uh, which is also central to the story of this, how this explosion happened. Add to that the failure of public services, whereby electricity, for instance, is not being provided uh, at all. So Lebanese pay twice for electricity, once to uh, the official provider who provides for a few hours a day, and then to back up electricity uh, with the generator. And that is being replicated very importantly also with uh, garbage collection, which doesn't work properly and which broke down in 2015, and with all sorts of other uh, sectors from education to health, uh, etc. So these, these crises have all come together and uh, by October 2019, people have had enough. And that's what really sort of tipped people over the edge into, into protests. Dr. Salouk, the history of Lebanon is marked largely by, by sectarianism, a state that is unique in the region in that, though it's an Arab country, uh, it has a large Christian population that I believe is still defined as a Christian nation with an Arab culture. But although there's a large Christian population, they constitute certainly not a majority and probably and certainly probably not a plurality any longer. But the government is organized based on sectarianism. Can you give us a little bit of that history and some of the challenges that sectarianism poses for governance in Lebanon? Well, first of all, there was nothing inevitable about Lebanon. Uh, and there's nothing inevitable about sectarianism in Lebanon. These are historical choices. Lebanon, when it was created, and we're now about to quote-unquote celebrate the centennial of the country, when it was created by the French in the 1st of September 1920, it was created to actually serve French interests and only in part to also address Christian, namely Maronite demands for a state of their own in uh, what later becomes known as Lebanon. And so to put, to stitch this country together in a typical colonial fashion, uh, the French negotiated what we call a power sharing uh, arrangement between uh, largely the uh, representatives of the Maronite community who spoke on behalf of the Christians of the country and representatives of the Sunni community who spoke on behalf of the Muslims. Now, the problem with this uh, is that this often is used by pundits and commentators to uh, put front and center the issue of sectarianism, as if the sectarianism is the raison d'etre of the formation of the country, which is not the case. In fact, uh, throughout the long history of Mount Lebanon, uh, and certainly the period from the uh, middle 19th century, late 19th century, when a certain order was created for Mount Lebanon, all the way until the creation of Grand Liban, Greater Lebanon, in 1920, sectarianism or sectarian modes of mobilization were only one among many different visions of 
Mount Lebanon and then uh, Lebanon, to borrow from the great historian Albert Horani. So it was a combination of uh, colonial design choice, demands by you know, religious elites, and later from below that make sectarianism the main mode of political mobilization and identification. But it was only one among many others. And so I think it, it's, it's not really useful to put sectarianism front and center. Uh, what happens is that in many ways, the institutionalization of sectarian identities into the political system create this uh, dynamic where uh, p- people take sectarian identities rather than alternative identities, you know, regional, socioeconomic, national, ideological, gender, they take sectarian identities as the main, not the, not the only, but the main sources of identification. But I've argued in some of my work, and Hannes has argued in his own work as well, uh, that you know, there is a system, and the political economy is a big part of the system, that reproduces these sectarian identities. Now, if we jump to the post-war period, I think a lot of what's happening today has its origins in the immediate post-war period and in what Hannes and myself have called the political economy of sectarianism. So there is an ensemble of institutional, economic, discursive practices that reproduce sectarian modes of identification and sectarian identities and make them or make people think that these are the most uh, useful ones to mobilize around. I actually think we've reached the end of this. The, The crisis we are living today is a consequence of the crisis of uh, what John Nagel has called zombie power sharing. That is a, a, a political system that is really dead, but nobody can bury it because nobody knows what to replace it with. It's also really the crisis, as Hannes was describing earlier, the post-war political economy. And when you combine these two together and they feed off each other, I think you uh, reach... Uh, the the situation where the country is in now, this massive economic, financial, political crisis, and now with this disaster, a massive humanitarian crisis. So, Dr. Bauman, that kind of raises the issue when we think of issues of identity sectarianism would represent. The political crisis then frequently manifests itself because one group has political and or economic power over other groups. Is the suffering in Lebanon been pretty much equal or relatively equal across the different groups, which might create kind of a new Lebanese identity or what uh, Dr. Saluk suggested was this zombie state of sectarianism? Does the state serve the interests of one group over another? And is, is anything changing with that if it has in the past? Uh, I think that's an excellent question, but I think it needs, it desperately needs a rephrasing of the way of thinking about it. So it's not so much one group, uh, one sect having all the economic opportunities and not leaving any for other sects. That may have been true partially, say, before the Civil War, um, but I think it's not true anymore. It's much more complicated. The way to think about it is uh, an unaccountable political elite using sectarianism to remain in political control, right? All positions in the state, all governmental positions or are divided according to sect. So any leader who wants to uh, be president or prime minister or speaker of parliament has to act, first of all, as the defender of his or her sect, even if people, the population, the citizens don't necessarily want to be put in those boxes. And citizens have to interact with the politicians and with the state on the basis of their religion. Now, what you have then is an unaccountable elite uh, that was creating political uh, economic opportunities for themselves, earning what could be referred to as rents, super profits, uh, through control of different markets. And then they were cascading that down to their following, to their clientelistic uh, following, uh, primarily along sectarian lines to get votes. Um, And so what Basel describes in his book 
is how uh, this clientelism and how these different mechanisms, these political economy mechanisms, uh, 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 force people to always think of themselves along sectarian lines. So, uh, uh, you know, Lebanese might go to sectarian schools, they might uh, have to rely on politicians to uh, help them get a job. Uh, and so, you know, you get socialized into these things as well. But it doesn't mean that the system is necessarily natural or, or given or indeed immutable. And I think what Basel was emphasizing there, and I think he's, he's right there, is that the protests we've seen have been trying to uh, put forward uh, a, an alternative way of thinking about society, uh, one which emphasizes social justice, one which emphasizes dignity, and sort of rejects the fear of one group against another. So it's not, it's not different groups vying for a share of the pie, not different sectarian groups vying for the share of the pie. It's the leaders trying to maintain a, a vision of societies, of sectarian divided society, and society sort of rebelling against that and the political economy that, that comes with it. You're listening to Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Doug Becker. We're discussing the economic and political crisis unfolding in Lebanon. So I know that the war was largely about sectarianism and you know, about different groups, but there was also these calls for restructuring the government, restructuring society as a means to try to recreate a society so the conditions of the war wouldn't break out. And you know, the peace accords, the Taif Accords, which ended the war, were at least in part trying to address this. Dr. Saluk, are you suggesting that this is a process that's, that's actually been fairly successful at trying to, trying to restructure Lebanese society or perhaps even the, the economic conditions and in particular the, the, the protests could create more of a Lebanese identity or maybe a class-based identity as opposed to a uh, sectarian-based identity? I think, you know, we don't need to debate Lebanese identity. I mean, certainly Lebanese identity today is uh, much more evident and, uh, and much more powerful than it was 1920. And, you know, that's, that's part of the historical process of state formation. But the way Lebanese, the way different Lebanese communities imagine Lebanon remains different. And, you know, as someone who studied in Canada, uh, I don't see any problem with that. One simply needs to find a way to reconcile these different visions. But what happens after the war is much more important in the sense that what was a political system that gave much, a, a bigger share of the predetermined sectarian quotas and more importantly, uh, allowed Christians, but namely Maronites, to monopolize the most powerful positions in the public sector, was changed in the post-war period. And uh, this was changed into a predetermined sectarian quota whereby positions were divided equitably, and a lot of important positions in the public sector and the state were given to the Muslim, the, the, the Muslim communities. But I think there's something much more important than that, and that it's the political economic pact that was created immediately after the end of the war, whereby under the guise of rebuilding the state and reconstruction, post-war reconstruction, the, the sectarian political elite would enrich themselves at the expense of uh, state financial stability. And that is when this political economy of sectarianism was built, whereby the state is not the barbarian image of the state in Lebanon. The state is nothing but, I call it an archipelago of clientelistic networks. So as Hannes was saying, each sectarian leader colonizes part of the state and turns these state institutions to, into what... Uh, Renee Linders calls bastions of privilege for their own partisans. And so when you add all these clientelistic networks together, they become something we call a state. But in reality, the state doesn't exist. And that's what we're discovering the hard way after this disaster. That political economy where you were under the guise of rebuilding the state, 
uh, you, the sectarian elite enriches themselves and they keep expanding the size of the public sector and they keep borrowing uh, money to uh, cover the deficit of the state and the, the debt increases and increases and increases, that political economy exploded on the 17th of October. And what we are witnessing now is, is an attempt by the sectarian elite. It's, it's, you know, when you look at it, the country today is divided primarily between those who want to maintain their hold onto the sectarian system and who, those who are saying this system has died and we need to think of something new. We need to build something new. And so I think we're really living now the consequences of this explosion. So Dr. Bauman, I know that the 2019 protests, the, the October protests, the trigger of them at least were certainly economic in nature, the additional taxes that were being proposed you know, by the government. And then you're both describing a government that is, uh, is indebted largely because of this, the clientelistic form of, of politics where public office is, is a means by which to sort of pay off for political support for your groups or, you know, for, you know, for, for your networks. And so ultimately, is it fair to say that the nation in crisis, it's, it's, it's a crisis of debt led by this clientelistic uh, system and that the Lebanese protesters at least seem to be, pre, you know, pretty united in trying to change their relationship with their government, particularly the economic relationship with their government. Yes. What you have to bear in mind with regard to, to the currency is that it was a brazen and almost impossible system to maintain for so long. So the central bank governor used to win awards for the way that he was managing this pig. And in many ways, uh, you know, he, he's failed now, but in many ways he deserved these, uh, these awards because it was such a, uh, such a, uh, a difficult system to maintain. And uh, he, he kept up an illusion for many years that it was sustainable. And now that that, that has been uh, revealed as completely untrue, I think a lot of trust has been lost and that's, that's what comes out of it. And so what is interesting about the state is yes, it's, it's sectarian fiefdoms, but if we look at a key institution such as the central bank, all these uh, different uh, former warlords and the business people who turned politicians that are sort of running Lebanese politics, who are at the head of the state, uh, they can come together and build institutions that benefit all of them. So having this, what some people have called this extended Ponzi scheme of Lebanese uh, debt running for so long, you know, benefited everyone. So, so that's another aspect of the Lebanese state. If there is something to be gained from working together, then the state can actually be quite efficient and effective. Um, so the central bank was an example. And another example was also uh, the reconstruction of central Beirut, which was basically outsourced to uh, a single private developer. So you have to imagine sort of the, the center of London around Trafalgar Square all being uh, privatized and given to a single developer who then builds luxury housing onto to it. And so the state is quite capable when, when it wants to and when it benefits the politicians, and it wasn't given anything back uh, to the citizens in return. Uh, and I think that stands at the, uh, at the center of, of the, the protests. Dr. Salouk, we know that Lebanon, like so many countries, has been deeply affected by the, by the pandemic. How bad has the pandemic been in Lebanon? What has been the government's response? We have to put, put the pandemic in Lebanon in context. I mean, this hit the country after a, a new cabinet was created. Uh, in response to the 17 October revolution or uprising. Uh, what is interesting is that, uh, and this links up with what you were saying and what Hannes was saying, I mean, the, 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 the October uprising was an attempt to tell the politicians that enough is enough. I mean, you, you've enriched yourself with decades of corruption. You have destroyed the state and the finances of the state. And, you know, now is the time to put a limit to this. 
of course, uh, what, hap what happened in 17 October is you had two simultaneous struggles going on at the same time. One between the sectarian communities of Lebanon and this anti-sectarian community that was being born. But there was another, I think, much more important struggle inside the, the sectarian political elite over, you know, what kind of reforms do we have to undertake to salvage the system? Because ultimately, the state is central for their ability to enrich themselves and to maintain their positions of power. And so parts of the sectarian elite came up with this Diab cabinet simply to defuse uh, the popular protest and to deflect attention from the October uprising. And uh, it was for those of us who were demanding concrete, genuine change, the, the cabinet was nothing but an attempt by a section of the sectarian elite, the political elite, to salvage themselves, to save themselves, and to hide behind this cabinet. And I'm afraid the COVID-19 crisis came to this cabinet as a heaven sent because it allowed them to bracket politics for a second and to uh, undertake really straightforward public health response to, uh, to the crisis. And Lebanon is a country with talented public health uh, experts. And so the, f the first phase of the response was quite good. But then we started witnessing really just how little of a state we have in this country in the sense that as the COVID-19 crisis became contained and there was, again, more focus and attention on the financial and the uh, economic crisis, people were no longer willing to abide by government uh, uh, regulations and policies. And when people know that the state is not a state, they will not listen to the state. And you know, your program is addressing scholars. And I think that's, you know, Lebanon is a very interesting case of what we mean when we talk about states, states and non-state actors, uh, because often these two things overlap at the same time time. And so the cabinet tried to use the early uh, response to the COVID-19 crisis to capitalize uh, on this. But then increasingly, as the airport was opened, as people re started realizing that the, a lot of the logic behind the lockdown was actually to keep people in their houses lest they protest, and they started going down, things things went out of control. And I'm afraid now, with, I mean, when this devastating uh, explosion happened, we were supposed to go back to another lockdown. And of, because the numbers were jumping uh, in, with COVID-19. And that had a lot to do with the fact that people were simply unwilling to listen and to do what the government was telling them to do, because they have simply no trust in this government. But Dr. Bauman, in the midst of this question about a crisis of trust in the government, it appears as though there's going to have to be some difficult decisions made if Lebanon, in fact, does receive aid from the International Monetary Fund. I know there's been negotiations between the IMF and the government. How difficult will any sort of structural adjustment or reorganization of the economy that the IMF is likely to require if there's going to be any sort of aid to try to lift uh, Lebanon out of its financial, its current financial crisis? I think there are two problems. The first uh, difficulty is reaching an agreement in the first place. Right? And there are two obstacles to that. The first uh, sort of round of negotiations broke down, and Basel might know more of the details, but looking from afar, it seemed like the uh, um, like the political elites and also the central bank were not able to agree on um, the steps that were necessary to, you know, if you go to the IMF, you have to make promises of, of, of see that changes uh, is sort of tested for who wins and who loses. Uh, and with an IMF program, there would have been a lot of losers 
uh, and uh, that was that's simply untenable for a lot of uh, Lebanese politicians. So they couldn't agree uh, on on the steps that are necessary. Um, the other complication is uh, with the United States. Uh, the United States is very uh, uh, influential uh, in decision making of the International Monetary Fund. Um, and their interest is, of course, in Lebanon is not simply just uh, economic, but also, of course, uh, the sort of looming presence of uh, Hezbollah, Shia militia uh, allied to Iran, sort of in the background uh, and, and as the most influential political actor. And so, you know, the IMF is a, is a way to influence uh, Lebanese politics and put it under pressure. So, so let's see if, if, if an agreement happens. But I guess uh, it will be necessary because Lebanon is desperate for, for that kind of aid. I just don't see the road uh, going there. Secondly, what is the uh, IMF going to uh, impose? One is uh, austerity, reducing uh, government expenditure. And there's often talk in, the Lebanese, uh, in, in Lebanon uh, about having a bloated state and uh, overblown bureaucracy. But what we also have to remember is, yes, there is clientelism. Uh, there are too many uh, people maybe working in certain branches of the bureaucracy. But it's actually not so much the number of people who work there, it's, it, it's how they were recruited uh, uh, along clientelist lines. And so the state is very much necessary. Lebanon needs investment in infrastructure, in education, in healthcare very desperately. Uh, and that is very difficult to do under IMF imposed uh, austerity. The second one is that they're very likely to ask for privatization of uh, some state controlled assets. And the difficulty with privatization under a corrupt government is that the privatization itself is likely to be corrupt. So, you know, there's, there's these difficulties at different stages, first getting to an IMF agreement, and then the politics of actually implementing it might be very, very painful. And so, you know, even with an IMF agreement, I think the road to a more sustainable economic system is a very difficult, difficult one. If I may add something here, this is Lasso. Lebanon today is in this really very strange situation where, you know, quote unquote, leftist agents and actors or forces, if you like, inviting the IMF simply because they know that without the IMF, the political elite will not undertake the kind of reforms that the country so desperately needs. And so you have this. Uh, as Hannes was saying, you know, there is this, I mean, this problematic situation where you know that if the IMF comes in, they will demand austerity measures. They will demand devaluation of the currency, privatization, uh, slashing the public sector, slashing the budget deficit, and so on. But at the same time, the country needs investment in all kinds of sectors because the post-war period most of the investments were, uh, were built with a kind of a corrupt logic, were overpriced and did not uh, survive the test of time. So you have this weird situation where those who want to force the political economic elite to make changes think that they can only do this with the IMF, but these are the same forces who are against privatization and against the, the very things an IMF program will usually put up front and center. Dr. Bauman, you also suggested that the, the United States is going to play a role in this, in there's going to be an IMF uh, bailout or IMF program. I imagine the two primary interests of the United States in Lebanon today would be, first, if there's going to be privatization, opportunities for American corporations, American investors to potentially invest in Lebanon. And second, of course, kind of a geo, or at least a regional strategic interest. The US policy uh, in the region certainly seems to be driven by their interests and their alliance with Israel. Do you imagine that those are gonna be complications coming from the US and the US might try to use the leverage that they have uh, in this situation on those two issues? And then what would be the implications of that? I think uh, the issue of Hezbollah and, and strategic interest is a more important one. The role of American corporations in Lebanon is not really comparable uh, to, say, uh, American corporations in Latin America or parts of Asia, 
uh, etc. So um, that, that's less of a consideration. Most of the foreign investment going to Lebanon actually came from Gulf countries going to things like luxury real estate uh, and partly also to uh, uh, from Europe possibly. Uh, so that's less of an interest. The, the main interest is really within the wider uh, regional politics and there the the Middle East region has been um, marked uh, by a great power conflict in a sense between two regional powers uh, which uh, one of which is Saudi Arabia and the other one is Iran uh, and of course you have the uh, conflict between Israel uh, and the Palestinians and the wider conflict with with the other Arab states and so that's I think that's going to be the main uh, consideration of the United States vis-a-vis -vis Lebanon uh, the economic interests uh, less so. So that that makes for quite interesting dynamic. Now, if I just may say something, because of course uh, the Americans are not the only foreign power. Europeans are also very nervous. Uh, they're very nervous. They've had the uh, influx of refugees from Syria uh, over the last five years, and uh, I think that will be one of their main considerations: the stability of Lebanon, where over one million Syrians live at the moment. Uh, and so they will be very, very interested. They have the opposite interest. They really want the IMF <laughs> to give money to, uh, uh, to Lebanon and, and to help it out. Dr. Salouk, the explosion in many ways creates this opportunity for global attention on Lebanon. And with the crisis ongoing in Lebanon, there is an opportunity for a reconstruction, a rebuilding, a reimagining the state. First, do you think since you've described this state as not functioning, is there a real potential for rebirth for the nation? And if so, how do you imagine we can look you know, to the state to improve, to, to rebuild, to, to, to try to restructure itself so that it simply works better? Well, it's functioning, uh, but for the wrong reasons, which are to enrich the uh, political elite and their, you know, clientelistic sectarian uh, uh, partisans. So I think that President, I mean, I think President Macron in his trip was very clear. Uh, there is now a, an international consensus that uh, the state, the Lebanese government, and, and again, uh, these political elites uh, who hide sometimes behind the state will not receive any aid direct financial aid unless they not commit, because they've committed in the past, implement deep and structural reforms, uh, whether it is uh, regarding the independence of the judiciary, uh, uh, regarding the public sector, uh, corruption, what have you. And I think this is really the $1 million question. How do you convince a political elite to implement the kind of reforms that will prove to be their unmaking. Uh, who gives in first? What, are they willing to budge or are they willing to risk bringing down the whole edifice and with them the whole population as they resist pressure from the international community? Part of it, as Hannes was saying, has a lot to do with the geopolitical contest in the region. But a big part of it is uh, comes out from a very clear diagnosis of the main problem in Lebanon, which is systemic corruption, uh, wasteful funds, criminal negligence, and what have you. I think that is the question that is facing us as a society uh, now. Who will blink first? Uh, the political elite in Lebanon thinks that the international community will blink first because they keep threatening them with these waves of refugees who will flood the shores of Europe. But I think they're actually using us as ransom. They're telling the international community that if you don't give aid, Lebanese society will collapse. And we will all, those of us who can, will pack their bags and leave. And you will left with their own direct partisans. Uh, I think that's the main challenge today. And, uh, if I read this political elite correctly, uh, they will fight till the end to resist implementing the kind of reforms that will undermine their clientelistic networks and their own in 
personal vested interest in the, in the system. You're listening to Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Doug Becker. We're discussing the economic and political crisis unfolding in Lebanon. And Dr. Bauman, do you agree that this ongoing political drama between the elites, international actors, and, you know, and uh, in individual political actors, in that the kinds of reforms that Lebanon needs is going to threaten the political position of these elites, and they're unlikely to go without a fight. Uh, and I mean, will they win this fight? I think we're at a, at a position, Basil was saying earlier, we're at a crossroads, where either you have the renewal or you have the knockout blow. And, and Basil was just describing the knockout blow of, of a very cynical elite using their last resources, geopolitical and vis-a-vis and -vis the society, to essentially ruin the, uh, 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 the future of the country in order to maintain control. Uh, so we're dealing with a very cynical elite. So I'll, I'll look at if there's a way uh, for renewal at all. Um, and the difficulty that the protesters have is that uh, there's no single sort of interlocutor to the government. There's no opposition party. There's no, uh, you know, in the, in the 1980s, uh, you had in Latin America or in Eastern Europe, if there was democratization, there was a round table and there was someone else to sit on the, on the other side of the round table. But things in Lebanon are a bit more complicated. Uh, because civil society, for instance, is often so suffused with these clientelist networks themselves. And, and, and the elites have been very good at co-opting people. So it's very difficult uh, for protesters, for opposition to kind of break loose of that, first of all. And secondly, uh, when they did manage to get people onto the street, uh, the next step then is to, to make coherent demands of the, uh, of the government. Uh, you know, usually it's um, the question of who will sit in the government, uh, what electoral system you're going to use. These kind of questions will have to come on the table, and it's very difficult to to formulate uh, uh, coherent demands uh, in that respect. What gives me hope uh, with regards to uh, the economy is that there are many uh, proposals by Lebanese economists uh, for uh, economic alternatives, for instance. What also gives me hope uh, is, I think, signs of uh, a sort of an economy of solidarity uh, that we see emerging, both during the protests when people were sort of looking after each other's children, uh, for instance, providing childcare while others were, were protesting. Uh, during uh, uh, garbage protests in 2015, there were new initiatives for recycling, uh, for avoiding waste, for, for tackling the root causes of the problems. And now we see uh, uh, an amazing solidarity among Lebanese working together to clear the rubble and rebuild their country after this explosion. So there are signs for hope. It's just a, a question of overcoming this very cynical political elite. And Dr. Salouk, considering the international attention that the explosion has garnered, we made some references to the potential for official development assistance perhaps coming from governments. But I also imagine there's the likely potential of a fairly substantial amount of private capital flowing in, in the form of donations, in the form of, of different non-governmental organizations. And I know in other countries where they've had natural disasters in the midst of government crisis and, and potential conflict, I think of, for instance, the impact of the tsunami on a number of nations. It can have a positive effect, but of course can also have a very negative effect. What can external actors, NGOs, people who are donating and the groups who might, you know, who might intervene with funding to help rebuild uh, after the explosion, what sorts of policies, what sorts of programs, what sorts of uh, projects should they focus on to try to rebuild Lebanon in a way that will benefit a future Leban uh, Lebanese economy and political structure, as opposed to potentially exacerbating these problems? Well, that's another bone of contention between the government and the sectarian political elite, on one hand, and all the organizations and institutions affiliated with them, and those Lebanese who want change, and a big chunk of the international community on the other hand. And the, the issue is, how do you uh, channel aid? How do you uh, send aid to Lebanon? And uh, yesterday, the French president was adamant, uh, and there were protesters shouting at him and telling him, 
no money to the government, no money to the state. The money should directly go to the people. And I think now there is, uh, it, I think the, uh, they're going to have a meeting on Sunday that the French president is going to, is hoping for a very high profile meeting of donors and aid will only be channeled through the UN. And that is creating friction with, with a besieged Lebanese government because they want to actually use cynically again what has happened to break the siege and to demonstrate that the whole world is coming uh, back to Lebanon and engaging again with them and so on. And they want aid, as is always the case in Lebanon, to be channeled. This was, the, this was again the, the same scenario after the 2006 war. They wanted all aid to be channeled through the state, through state institutions, because that's how they can redirect it towards their own clientelistic networks. And so I think this is, again, another very important uh, contentious uh, issue. I, I think this time the international community will stand its ground and will find ways, and there are a lot of uh, uh, non-governmental organizations in Lebanon, like the Red Cross and others, uh, who, who they can trust in. And of course, there is the, the, the other thing, which is the Lebanese diaspora. And these are also, these, they have also been mobilizing in the past couple of days, and they've already uh, found a lot of, you know, uh, put together a lot of funds. But you have a problem that we are technically living in Lebanon under an uh, unofficial capital control. And so, because of the financial crisis, and so there are difficulties for Lebanese in the diaspora to send money to the country and to make sure that these will be, uh, you know, will be released uh, by the banks and so on. Uh, this could not have come at a more difficult time. And I remember a couple of months ago, I wrote an op-ed and I said, described something, uh, some, uh, you know, something akin to a perfect storm. And then you, you get this explosion, which destroys half of the city and then creates an even more perfect storm for the country. Uh, but, but aid and the, the, the how you channel aid is going to be a battle between the Lebanese government and the international community. And that's the international relations scholar in me sees this happening frequently, this ongoing struggle, this political drama between the local state and international actors who has this power to be able to try to craft the, the, the funding that goes into reconstruction in ways that they could see as more beneficial, or do they simply rely on, on, on local actors uh, in order for the aid to flow, even though those local actors may not use that aid in a way that is best towards reconstruction? So, Dr. Baum, uh, yeah, do you see that same thing? Yeah, yeah so if I might just jump in here, Hannes. Um, yes. Uh, to, to, to emphasize that point and maybe just make the point that we, we're emphasizing the culpability of the Lebanese elites. But for many years, especially when Lebanon was uh, sort of strategically important around 2005 to 2010, a lot of foreign funding was run, going into Lebanon and was in, in a sense indulging uh, the current uh, elites in a sort of geopolitical game. So it's very important that that is not being repeated again. There is a certain culpability of foreign donors, foreign states, uh, in propping up the system as it exists today. So, Dr. Saluk, is sort of a, a as a conclusion here, being in the midst of all of this, how do people around you and how are you holding up, considering the, you know, the the suddenness, the, the shock, the destruction of the explosion, and what can we as as people outside of Lebanon do? to serve as to be the most positive agents of change or to be able to help the people in Beirut, the people in Lebanon that have been so devastated as a result, both of the explosion and of course the financial and political crisis? Well, look, I, I, I'm always amazed by my people, by the Lebanese. I mean, they are just, they don't give up. But I have to say that this time we're dealing with a, with a very different beast the overlap of all these crises, economic, financial, banking, COVID, and now this explosion. My greatest fear is that if the political economic elite, the sectarian elite, uh, 
continue to refuse the implementation of really important reforms and the kind of reforms that will unlock uh, resources uh, from the international community based on uh, an agreed upon uh, reform package. I, my greatest fear is that the Lebanon we have known will disappear. Uh, I know the Lebanese are strong people, particularly the younger generation who, who are fighting to maintain their Lebanon. They are they're really fighting for their Lebanon. One of the ironies of this explosion is that it hit hardest, Hannes would know this, it hit hardest that part of Beirut that really made you feel that you are part of the cosmopolitan world, not the world of sects and clientelistic relations and so on. But my, my greatest fear is that uh, the, the sectarian elite, the political elite, are trying to suck us into a situation where we will actually give up and leave. And so I think the greatest service for Lebanon is to maintain the pressure uh, on, this, uh, on this political elite and to ensure that uh, when money, money comes for reconstruction, we're repeating a term that we thought we have, had finished with. I mean, reconstruction was supposed to have happened after the war. We're going back to this term now. That it will be conditioned on a set of reforms that whether they like it or not, whether the political elite like it, likes it or not, will undermine the, their strangling of, of a big chunk of the population and their control of uh, state institutions. So Hans Bauman, final thoughts? I think I want to echo what, what Basel was saying. I've been going to Lebanon for, for almost 20 years and, and we've seen political assassinations, we've seen uh, wars, uh, we've seen all sorts of crises, but I've never seen Lebanese friends, uh, people on social media as despondent, as shocked to the core uh, as uh, they have been uh, after this explosion. And I think it also comes from the fact that um, I've never seen uh, Lebanese uh, friends, um, uh, colleagues, as elated uh, uh, as they had been in October. So it really has been uh, when the protests started and people really started imagining different political and economic futures. And so um, the um, it's been an emotional roller coaster, and I think that's why it also hits so hard now. This 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 this, this dramatic explosion, and I hope that the Lebanese, uh, and I'm sure that the Lebanese will find that spirit of uh, October uh, 2019, of October 17, uh, and hopefully find ways to realize these alternative uh, political uh, and economic futures. Kind of a reminder that the Lebanese people have obviously been an extremely resilient people and have been through quite a lot. But I guess the real question is, what will the future of Lebanon look like? And will it be the same? Will it resemble the Lebanon of the past? Will it proceed? Will, it be, will this be a future Lebanon that's stronger as a result of rebuilding? Or is it uh, potentially a, a broken nation that sadly mirrors broken nations in that region that so desperately could use need a rebirth? Dr. Saluk, I'll give you the, the final word. Is there hope of a rebirth or is Lebanon facing some very, very difficult times? Uh, as Hannes was saying, I think our greatest uh, source of optimism is the spirit of 17 October. And uh, that generation which is fighting, struggling for a, a new kind of Lebanon, a Lebanon that looks like them and does not look like their history. And as long as they're fighting, there is hope. And, you know, we'll keep pushing and fighting. We've been discussing the ongoing political and economic crisis in Lebanon, the crisis prior to the explosion this week, and, of course, the devastating effects of the explosion. And I certainly am hopeful, but because I, I think I'm always a bit of an optimist, but I like to think of myself as a realistic optimist. So I'm hoping that when we, ho when we have this show and revisit Lebanon, be speaking a bit more positively. Our guests have been Dr. Hannes Bauman, Senior Lecturer 
in the politics department at the University of Liverpool and visiting fellow at the London School of Economics Middle East Center. He is the author of Citizen Harari, Lebanon's Neoliberal Reconstruction and the Causes, Nature and Effect of the Current Crisis in Lebanese Capitalism. And Dr. Basil Seller, who is Associate Professor of Political Science in the Department of Social Sciences at the Lebanese American University. He is the author of Taif and the Lebanese State, The Political Economy of a Very Sectarian Public Sector, and co-author of The Politics of Sectarianism in Postwar Lebanon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you to our guests and to you for listening. The Scholars Circle team includes Doug Becker and Lillian Inc., contributing hosts, Ankine Agassian and Melissa Chiprin, managing producers, Sud Dongre, our webmaster, Tim Page and Mike Hurst, engineers and technical support. I'm Maria Armudian, and we'll see you next week.